Thank you. It's, uh, it's um, wonderful to be back here. Uh, this is, um, in many ways, uh, this is where the book began. Um, we knew we were going to do the book. I'll tell you just a little bit more about that after I introduce my colleagues up here. Um, but it was, I don't know how long ago it was. Uh, uh, we came down here knowing that this was the museum, this was the place uh, that we wanted to um, partner with, if you will, on this on this effort. And the Sixth Floor Museum has was great then and has been great since, and uh, and really is a partner in this book, and uh, we're proud of that because uh, we think nobody does it, uh, you know, like they do. Um, and uh, we hope the feeling was mutual. Um, to introduce my friends here, um, the first guy is uh, pretty well known in this town, um, and he's certainly well known with life, or so we thought. Um, it's Dick Stolle, um, who was the LA bureau chief back in the day, and we're going to talk about that. And he's the guy who got to Dallas um, in a heartbeat, along with his uh, colleagues Tommy Thompson, a writer, and Alan Grant, a photographer. Dick will tell you a little bit about that. But yesterday he was doing something here in town um, in conjunction with this visit, and somebody thought he was somebody else. How did that go, Dick? Alexander, uh, it's Bruder, uh, Abraham Bruder's granddaughter, and I were being photographed by Associated Press out uh, by the abutment where her grandfather stood to take these famous pictures. And this, this white-haired man came up and, and uh, tentatively and said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no. He said, by any chance, are you Abraham Zapruder? <laughs> <laughs> and Dick's joke at the, in the green room before we came out uh, was that uh, his response should have been, no, but she's Marina Oswald. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, uh, and, um, which segues, so Dick is, is a legend in our building. Um, he's founding editor of People Magazine. He was the managing editor of Life Magazine. Um, I'm proud to have known Dick for 15 or so years now um, and always, uh, you know, value his counsel and in this particular book valued his writing to the tune of a 7,000 word reminiscence about the efforts of the day. Dick mentioned Alex. Um, Alexandra Zapruder is the granddaughter of Abraham Zapruder, and she has written for us um, a, a piece that dovetails so beautifully with Dick's writing, um, and it's really uh, about what happened, you know, that day, and also what happened to the family and her and her, her grandfather um, subsequently, uh, and a project that she's working on at greater length for a book, uh, which is going to be about her grandfather, and also a narrative history of the of the famous film. Um, and then at the end here we have Jim Baker, J.I. Baker, uh, on a byline, um, novelist, uh, writer, nonfiction writer, um, uh, who we brought on board. He he wrote the fine. Um, and uh, intriguing novel, um, The Empty Glass, which is about the last uh, days of Marilyn Monroe. And um, it, it, it has the added advantage of not being wacky. Um, and so we thought, who better to look into the various conspiracy theories, which we knew we would have to do in our book and want to do, about uh, uh, surrounding the assassination. So Jim came on board to do that piece for us. Um, the book itself, just very briefly before um, these folks uh, start telling their stories, um, there are certain books that we do because at Life Books because we think they're going to do well or we hope they're going to do well. Um, and then there are certain books that are lighter or heavier. It's, it's like life has always been, you know, to see Luce's Manifesto in 36, to see life, to see the world. It just opens up every topic. But there are some books that we feel we have to do. Um, uh, there were certain stories that were ours. Um, you know, Luce himself said that life turned into a war magazine uh, during World War II, and certainly we've done a number of World War II books. Um, other stories, everything from Liz Taylor to the space race, we feel feel still. We felt in the day, and we feel still that we own them, that the, or or we need to, you know, pay attention to them. That they're part of our legacy, and we should deal with them uh, when appropriate. I'm not sure 
we've ever felt that way more about a story than the Kennedys. Um, it, we, we, um, we dealt with the presidency all the time, no matter who it was, but the Kennedys were different. I mean, here are the two most attractive people in the entire world, and we were a magazine that ran pictures. Um, so of course we're going to, you know, deal with the Kennedys early and often. They were on our cover when he was just a, uh, a congressman and they were not yet married in a high Peskin photograph of Jack and Jackie on the sailboat, uh, which is in the book. We do, you know, because of our legacy with them, we did a whole bunch of stuff leading into that day in Dallas, um, uh, you know, about our history with them and, 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 and who they were. Um, so we wanted to do this book, um, and it was every bit as involving and illuminating for us as, as we could have hoped. Um, these people um, helped illuminate me. We think they will help illuminate uh, you as readers, we hope. Um, and we'll start with Dick, because it's, it's dramatic from the get-go, as you know, as the museum one floor below us proves every day. Um, it remains riveting. Dick was in LA. He was our LA bureau chief. And all of a sudden, he had to get out of town. How did that go? We heard the news on the AP teletype. Um, I ran to the phone. I, I, I went to tell up and, and, and um, the, the, the news was being s s sort of spat out in, in just bulletins. Shots heard in Dealey Plaza and then bells ringing and, and it going down like that. It, it's incredibly visually exciting to see this uh, news not come on television but on words. I ran back to, to my office, called New York. They had just heard the news. The world was hearing it in two or three minutes there. And I said, what can we do? And, and the, the request was very simple. How fast can you get to Dallas? An hour later, four of us, two photographers, Tommy Thompson, the correspondent, who had called me over to the teletype machine, were on a National Airlines plane. Now, back then, before TSA, you could literally arrive three minutes before an airliner was about to leave and just run on and uh, uh, and the plane was filled with other journalists everyone had the same um, impulse and uh, as I say in the piece I think we we broke every FAA regulation <laughs> about domestic travel because there were people sitting in the aisle with these huge television cameras perched on their laps. And uh, I have to say, the pilot was extraordinarily lenient. He took off. Uh, <laughs> as I said, if we had encountered any turbulence, we would have wiped out LA media <laughs> in a matter of seconds. And uh, we landed in, in Dallas not long after Air Force One had taken off with the president's body and with the newly sworn in Lyndon Johnson. And um, along with Dick um, were Tommy and Alan. Was there anyone else from the LA Bureau? Don Cravens. And Don Cravens, who is a second photographer. And uh, it's, you know, in, in, in the way of a, a journalistic team or a football team, you know, they, they, they kind of hit the ground running and, and went in different directions. Um, you, you, how did you know where you were going, what, that you were going to pursue Dealey Plaza and what, what the story was you were after? Well, to be truthful, we didn't have a clue what the story was at that point. And, but the pilot was giving us news en route, and at one point he said there had been an arrest um, that somebody named Lee Harvey Oswald from Irving, Texas, had been arrested by the Dallas PD. And Tommy, who was a former uh, Texas reporter, said, 
I know the cops and Irving, the, the mark of a savvy journalist, I know the cops and Irving, let me go after that story. I said, Godspeed. So he took Alan Grant and in the next 24 hours scored an absolutely astonishing exclusive. He was the first and only reporter for several hours to be in the house with the Oswald family. Um, Marina and the two babies were then living with a woman, a Quaker woman named Ruth Payne. And um, Tommy and Alan found that house, <coughs> scouted it out Friday night to see it was too late by the time, and went back first thing in the morning. There was a cop in in the house. I mean, it, it's some idea. I mean, I know. I mean, no uh, aspersions on Dallas, but th th this was a city in absolute chaos at that point. I mean, kind of nothing was worth. People weren't downtown. The, all the restaurants and stores had closed, and and the, and the, and the police department. Um, put a cop in the house who opened the door and let these two Life Magazine journalists mm. walk right in. <laughs> I mean, it's partly the power of life, but they got a terrific story while I was negotiating on another part of the story. They got a terrific story, um, a, a remarkable story. Alan's photographs are so intimate of the babies, of Marina, of Robert Oswald, the brother, of the mother in particular, just, you know, in all of her uh, florid craziness, you know what I mean, <laughs> really, and and uh, and um, right in the house, that story. It, it, this is one of the things you find out when put, putting together a book like this. That story, so terrific, never ran. Um, it it ran for a little bit, but what was happening while Dick was going <clears throat> here and about to pursue. Um, Abraham's Zapruder and the Zapruder film uh, is that Life's editors obviously stopped the presses in Chicago and flew uh, an emergency edit team to Chicago to, and they ripped up some pages, um, several pages obviously, and started covering the story as best they could and they were going to edit it over there over the next couple of days and when they saw Grant's pictures of course and Tommy's great reporting um, you know, they laid, it, they laid it out, and it was going to be very impressive. And that's basically what we, the, the story that we, I have no idea what the original actually looked like, but we tried to recreate that story in the book because the photos have been in the archives for all these years. And Alan talked about it several times before his death, so we were trying to, we were able to recreate the whole thing. But why didn't it run? Well, Alan finishes his story. Everyone agrees it's wonderful. It's laid out. He flies back to Los Angeles. His job is done. Other photographers are hitting town and going out in different directions. Um, and then on Sunday morning, Lee Harvey Oswald is killed by Jack Ruby. So they stop the presses again. The original cover, you know, Dallas trivia, the original cover was Roger Staubach. Um, he was uh, winning the Heisman just then uh, as the quarterback of Navy. And uh, they were getting ready for the Army-Navy game, which JFK was quite looking forward to going to. Another footnote, um, qu very quickly, they did play the game. They were going to cancel it, but the Kennedys <coughs> insisted they play the game, said Jack would have wanted it. Um, Navy stopped Army on the two-yard line and won by six. Uh, so that worked out okay. Um, but Staubach, he, he's in the book. We talked to him. You know, he had lost his not only his his president, but he had lost a Navy man and his commander-in-chief. Um, and he's still moved by it to this day. So we had to rip up the Alan Grant story. And the, the piece didn't run back then. Um, they ran one photograph small. And so finding that stuff was fun. Meantime, Dick uh, goes off and is about to encounter Abraham Zapruder. Uh, Alex, who was Abraham Zapruder? before he shot that film? So I have to say that I, I was an infant when my grandfather died. Mm -hmm. And what I know about him comes mostly from my aunt, who's here, Myrna Reese. 
who's told me a great many stories about our grandfather. You know, from what I have learned about him, for one thing, he, he was born in Russia in 1905. He grew up in circumstances of really extraordinary poverty, and not extraordinary poverty, actually, poverty that was um, very common in that place and time. But, um, and anti-Semitism, it was a hard life. I think it was a very, very hard life. He didn't have a formal education. He, I think, was a person who had an enormous amount of innate talent and curiosity about the world. He was interested in ideas. He was interested in, in things and how things worked. And that was, those were interests and abilities that could never be expressed in um, living life as a Jew in Imperial Russia at that time. So for him, the fact that his family um, eventually emigrated to the United States was, was a great boon. That was a, was a great thing that happened. He was 15 when they came here. Um, they settled in Brooklyn. The story follows a very familiar pattern. Um, he went to night school to learn English and then went to work as a pattern maker on 7th Avenue um, as a dressmaker, just like all the other Jews did, basically. Um, and, and then gradually you know, built up his career and eventually came to Dallas and um, worked for Ben Gold, who was a you know a real institution here mm -hmm. in the garment industry, and then had his own business, a business that was not successful, and then finally Jennifer Juniors. And I, what I would say about what I sort of have come to to know about him is that, or what comes back again and again about him is that he was curious. You know, he he was curious about the world, and he loved you know he loved to take pictures. He loved his camera. He was a great, gifted musician. He never studied formally, but he could play incredibly well. And my aunt has told me many times that he would come home from work, and before he would take off his hat or anything, he would walk in the house and sit down at the piano and start to play. And anything that he could play, he had learned by ear. He had an incredible sense of humor. I mean, our family stories that we share about him are ones that you know, have just, they, we tell them again and, and again and again because he was funny and offbeat and quirky and um, interesting and, and he was someone who made something of his life out of nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all feel, I don't know, I mean, I would say for myself, incredibly proud and grateful. We are all here living the lives that we are living because they came here and made a life. Mm -hmm. And his office was right across the street. Right, 501 Elm Street. Yeah, the building right across the street there. Right, which is how it was that he the, was able the Dow to. The yeah. 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 And um, and so he had his camera and wasn't going to use it. Right, so the story <laughs> of the day is that he, um, he, he and my fam, he and everyone in the family were were devoted supporters of the president and the first lady. They were real Kennedy people and my aunt had gone to sell poll tax. Um, in South Dallas, right? Um, you know, very active in, in the campaign and involved. My, my father had just taken a job, um, specifically had come to Washington, moved to Washington just before the assassination to work um, in the Kennedy administration in the tax division of the Justice Department. My aunt that morning had gone down to Love Field with her friend Ruth, who's here today, to see the President and First Lady. So this was a family that loved the Kennedys, and that was this is no accident that he was he was there in that moment. But he did go to work that day without his camera, and the story is that it was overcast and, and rainy, and that he thought perhaps it wasn't good weather for filming, or maybe some time, some have said he was afraid he wouldn't be able to see the president or get close enough, or and so he went into the office, and Lillian Rogers, who was his longtime assistant and close friend, basically nudged him about it and mm -hmm. said, you know... Bludgeon is a better word. <laughs> <laughs> right. She was the only one probably aside from my grandmother who could have gotten him to do something that he didn't want to do. But she said, you know, you need to... What do you mean you don't have your camera? You know, what are you, crazy? This is it. This is your moment. You know, the president is coming and he's right here. And he said, no, no, I'm too short. I'll never be able to see him, et cetera, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> And she, the way she has told the story is she finally said, ah, you know, forget it. There's no, forget it. There's no, you know, convincing you of something. And she went upstairs to do something in the office and then she came back down a few minutes later and he was gone. Mm -hmm. And he had gone home. So he drove home and, and got the camera 
you know, and, and came back in time. So that was a, that was a close call, I mm -hmm. would say. Luckily for us, Lillian was on the job. So he, he, he shoots the famous film. You get, everybody knows that story. Um, and, uh, and then, Dick, this, this um, man who you're so often mistaken for a half century <laughs> later, how did you find him? When Tommy went off to chase the Oswald family, I went down to the Adolphus, and we set up, rented a suite, uh, set up a big temporary life office because other reporters and photographers were coming in from all over the country. And about 6 o'clock, I got a phone call from the woman named Patsy Swank, who was a, a life stringer. A stringer means part-time correspondent. She had been at the Dallas Police Department all afternoon, had gone home to feed her children, had gotten a phone call at home from a, another reporter who knew her, knew she worked for life, and said, Patsy, I just heard from a cop who'd heard from somebody who'd heard from whatever that a Dallas businessman was in Dealey Plaza with a movie camera and photographed the assassination. And when she conveyed this information to me, my heart rate went up 300 <laughs> percent. And and I said, "What was his name?" She said, "He he could only pronounce it. He didn't wasn't able to spell it." But and she I'll never forget it. It was just Zapruder. And I said, first name? Don't know." So. I thanked her, got out the Dallas, I'd never been to Dallas before, but I got out the Dallas phone book. The phone book used to be a very important reporting tool. <laughs> and I, I, I literally mm -hmm. ran my fingers down the Z's, and there was Z A P R U D E R, just exactly as she had pronounced it, comma, Abraham, and a phone number. And I started calling, and about 11 o'clock, this weary voice answered, uh, identified myself, uh, asked if this was Abraham Spruder, it was. I asked him several questions about the film. And finally I asked, can I come out and see it? Um, it, it? It was a very difficult question for me because the man was obviously suffering. Uh, we, we know his devotion to Kennedy, and you've got to remember, we, we've all seen the film. This man saw a president murdered with his very own eyes only a few hours before. He saw the crime. We see the film version of the crime. And I finally, he, he, was, he was a stricken man at that point, and, and I decided, don't push it. And I said, fine. And he said, come to my office at 9 tomorrow morning. I decided I had to push him around a little bit, so I got there at 8. <laughs> and um, that's when he showed the film to me and to two Secret Service agents in this windowless, whitewashed room across the street. And um, the uh, seeing that film for the first time was, I think, the most dramatic moment of my 70 years in journalism. And uh, as, as you, you know, um, life um, obtained the film at the time and uh, ran images in that first issue. Uh, we've run them again uh, throughout the years. We did not run uh, the famous uh, image of, of the, uh, the killing bullet um, at that time. It was an editor's decision. Um, and, uh, and Jim, before we talk about the conspiracy theories, Alex, quickly, what was your grandfather's attitude the rest of his years and the family's attitude toward the film? Um, so I think, you know, Dick 
alluded to this, you know, our, our grandfather's association with the film and our family's association with the film has never been a happy one. It is not something that in all of our years we have ever felt um, very comfortable with, I think I would say. You know, our grandfather was traumatized by what he saw. He had nightmares, I'm told, for years after the assassination. He was so, I mean, he's what you'd call a mensch. You know, he was a good guy. And he was in a position where he had taken this film and he had to figure out, first of all, not even to mention the entire day of the assassination of getting it developed, it was incredibly complicated, and, and how to take responsibility for it and how to keep himself together emotionally and under extreme pressure. Suddenly he's dealing with law enforcement and the media started to hound him almost immediately except for Dick, who was wonderful, but all the rest of them were horrible. Um, and, you know, he just, this is just, he was just a, I mean, he was a great guy, but he was a guy, you know, yeah. who could be ready for such a thing? Um, and so, and then he had to figure out what to do with this. And I think he was, and, and Dick has said this before, you know, the idea of, of selling it and of, people seeing it and of the Kennedys seeing it and you know in the moments after the assassination he called my father in Washington and my father remembered that you know he kept saying that he he was so worried about Mrs. Kennedy and he couldn't believe that she was there and that this had happened to her and so I, I just I guess what I want to say is that you know he tried to do the best he could in an incredibly difficult situation and we have tried to do the best we can in a difficult situation but um, I think our feelings about it are complicated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are we proud, I think, of our grandfather and the way he handled himself? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not an easy thing to be associated with something that brought so much pain mm -hmm. to so many people and something that was so complicated and this repeated showing of it and the attachment of our name, our strange, odd, weird name that nobody else has to this thing is is complicated, mm -hmm. I would say. And and we're all we all have dealt with it in our different ways. And in some ways my choice to write a book about it is really about trying to sort out that legacy and figure out what the film means in the world and what the film means for us or for me. Um, yeah. He kept saying to me what I was negotiating with him. He said, I do not want this film exploited. It was a word he used again and again. Um, and I am utterly convinced that Life magazine got this film because he trusted mm -hmm. this magazine. Uh, he, he realized that, uh, I mean, I assured him with no authority whatsoever to make such a promise <laughs> that, uh, but I knew the magazine and I knew the people who who ran it, and and I conveyed to them, I mean, this extraordinary kind of sensitivity to what would happen to this uh, famous film. And um, in the end, uh, he gave it to life, and I think with, with enormous relief uh, that we had it, and not some of the other journalists who had showed up He'd asked them to come at nine, and they came at nine, and uh, and they were out shouting and banging on the door while I was talking to him, and and uh, it was kind of a horrifying moment for him. Can I just mm -hmm. say one other thing, mm -hmm. and then I know you mm -hmm. um, no, no. want to hear no, from no, Jim, that's, but that's okay. um, I think the other thing that I, you know, being of my generation, having been born well after the assassination, you know, is something that I think is so important to try to remember that no one was not only were people not ready for the assassination of the president, but people weren't ready for the film, for the mm -hmm. existence of something like this. <laughs> there was no precedent for it. And so the, the, that visual, that violence in visual form and how that was gonna 
don't forget that it was a home movie. You know, it's something that people do forget. But it was a home movie. It wasn't the AP. It wasn't a professional reporter. It wasn't the White House, you know, press corps. Mm -hmm. It was just a guy with his own camera. Mm -hmm. And sort of how that made its way into the world and this tortured kind of journey, life's struggles, which are very apparent in, you know, the life records and then on throughout time, I think really speaks to how much how different things were then, mm -hmm. you know, that now we are so accustomed to seeing violence, we've seen it all. But then, you know, people really grappled with what to show and how to show it and what was right and what was wrong. And those are, we talked about this, those are sort of earnest mm -hmm. questions that don't even get asked in the media, I don't think, anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but they were the questions of the time, mm -hmm. you know, and partly because the Zapruder film made people have to ask those questions that mm. they perhaps hadn't asked before. Mm -hmm. When frame 313, which is the headshot, the infamous with blood and brain spurting up into the air, these two Secret Service men and I were watching this, no sound, just the old kind of crickety eight millimeter projector. Now, these are two Secret Service agents who are about to see filmed evidence of their inability to do the single most important responsibility they get when they are sworn in. You will protect the President of the United States against all enemies whatsoever. They failed. Frame 313, the headshot comes up, beamed on this whitewashed wall, the three of us all went, ugh, literally, as if we had all been gut punched simultaneously. It was an incredible moment. Um, a very quick bit of um, housekeeping, and I'm going to ask Jim a question. Um, you've been given. Um, the tickets for questions. We're going to open this up to Q&A in a little bit. I already have some of them, but if you could pass the others along, uh, we'll collect them. And um, if you had any questions for any of our panelists. Jim, we've, we've seen, we've, we've heard rather already, uh, you know, just in life's coverage, um, there, there are a million coincidences that led to, a, Dick, in your piece, you point out, uh, is it seven? Coincidences that if they didn't happen, yes, or right. you know, if they didn't happen, something else wouldn't <laughs> have happened. Um, and uh, you know, and if your granddad hadn't gone and got the camera, a lot else wouldn't have happened. Um, what I mean, he, these are the seeds of, of, of conspiracy, um, uh, you know, uh, or conspiracy theories, because and there are going to be a million more coincidences and things reinterpreted in this story as it, as it unfolds over the next several hours and then over the next um, days and weeks. Um, to the many conflicting opinions surrounding the conspiracy theories that are all out there, and, we, and you examined ten of them for us, um, did they make the story, or did they continue to make the story especially hard to report? Uh, it was the most unique thing I've ever done in my career as a journalist because I actually interviewed the filmmaker and the documentarian Errol Morris who articulated it in a, this way that I would. Um, he said, you know, he compared it to the filming of, he compared his own investigations and his friends investigations into the assassination with uh, his movie The Thin Blue Line uh, which was basically uncovering a mystery and solving a mystery and as a reporter you are gathering information that starts to build a story that theoretically is going to feel conclusive in some way or that you're going to have some sort of final opinion about. And I'm, I've been interested in uh, a bit of a student of the assassination for most of my life, but and so I had a pretty good sense that there was sort of a bottomless pit in terms of the theories surrounding this thing. But when I actually really went into it and started talking to experts, it was just astonishing to me that there's no end to the sort of hall of mirrors quality of the theories that go on. You know, you have a piece of evidence that one person interprets one way and it sounds convincing, and then the same piece of evidence goes to someone else and they have a completely different interpretation of it. And the Zapruder film is a perfect case in point. Nobody can 
you know, we have this objective piece for the first time perhaps in history, this re recorded what we think of as an objective record of this tragedy, and nobody can tell you exactly what is happening on it. Mm -hmm. You know, definitively, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is the forward motion of the head from frame 314 mm -hmm. to frame 320, what is that? Mm -hmm. Is it a neuromuscular reaction or is it evidence of the, another shot coming from the grassy knoll? You know, it's, and that's just the beginning. And, uh, and, and dealing with, the, you know, the people on, in dealing with the, uh, the experts, the writers who've spent an awful lot of time looking into this on both sides of the question, did you find in researching it for us a qualitative difference uh, between the armies of the right and the armies of the left on this question? Are they different kinds of people or are they the same? They, well, I mean, it's a, making a bit of a generalization, but perhaps it's not. First of all, it's very difficult to find a real journalist that has dug into this from the perspective of the conspiracy. I mean, it's, I don't really know of any seemingly or, or, or any very solid journalistic work that in any way conclusively suggests that there was a conspiracy. But there are people, uh, I think of the journalist Anthony Summers, who tends a little bit in that direction, and he's a solid guy. Um, and I'm not speaking of him when I say this. I want to be clear about that because mm -hmm. he's a he's a uh, very sane individual. But there were a number of these <laughs> these guys that I spoke to who had interesting perspectives on the assassination, who were, you know, tilted in the direction of the conspiracy, who really were uh, nutty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even when they had very interesting things to say, I had uh, some trouble. But, with them. And yet, and yet, seventy percent of um, of Americans think there might have been a conspiracy, or think there was a conspiracy. Or, well, I think but they don't know what it was necessarily. I think that we were talking about this earlier. Uh, Gerald Posner, whose book mm -hmm. Case Closed is quite good, um, he was saying that in a sense there were conspiracies. There were bureaucratic mm -hmm. conspiracies. You had the FBI who didn't want to know that one of their J. Edgar Hoover's agents was was investigating Marina and Lee. He, you know, how would that have looked, Jay, how would that have made the FBI look if it had come out that they were actually onto this guy, but he killed the president? You know, you had um, Alan Dulles, in the, um, who was a member of the Warren uh, Commission, but who was also, he, he used to be the head of the CIA, who didn't really want the information about the CIA's connections to Cuba out there. So you had a kind of bureaucratic conspiracy of people who were trying to tamp some of this stuff down. Yeah. and. In a way, maybe that just kind of gets out there, you know. I should say, you know, I mean, Life's editor's decision not to run frame 313 back in the day because it was a different day um, was evidence for many of a conspiracy, uh, that life was part of a conspiracy. And even um, more edifying for you people who are here today, Dick Stolle is named himself in two conspiracy theories. Two. So, it's so this is this is how esteemed this man is. It's a he is he, he is he is yes, part sure. of the subject matter that yeah. Jim had to go investigate. That's um, and did you find out anything about? No, it's um, uh, the um, the conspiracy theories. One more time, Jim, uh, because it is something that you know so much happened on the 22nd and then it was done. But I don't think, um, have you ever seen a story that lingers like this one? No, and I think it's, uh, you know, we Did you learn anything new? Well, I learned a lot that, what you know, uh, I think the main thing I learned, uh, mm -hmm. that the thing that really surprised me was the extent of what exists in the Warren Commission exhibits. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, it's not just the Warren Commission report. They had 26 volumes of, of additional exhibits, mm -hmm. as you probably know. And, oh, my, you know, it's, uh, it's endless. I mean, there's a it's like everything but the kitchen sink and that stuff, including, like, uh, records of uh, Jack Ruby's mother's hospital visits. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's endless fuel, again, for anybody mm -hmm. who wants to dig up that stuff. There is a lot of really weird stuff in there. Mm -hmm. But... There's going to be a lot of weird stuff in anything if you've got a mass of material about human behavior, you mm -hmm. know. So I, that really surprised mm -hmm. me was some of the 
interesting but also bizarre and, and in a way banal stuff that's packed into these 26 volumes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't believe for a second that um, our book is going to put in, or any of the other books that are coming out this month is going to put an end to any of this. Um, you know, it's, uh, it will go on. Um, before I go to the Q&As, and we have a bunch, um, and uh, do any of the three of you want to add anything that we haven't prompted here uh, about Dallas then, Dallas now, um, uh, that... Uh, One thing I think that, that speaks to Abraham Spruder's generosity and character is I got print rights on Saturday morning, the New York editors and Henry Luce himself saw the film, copy of the film, over the weekend, and they were so struck by the incredible impact of this. They called me up on Sunday and said, we've decided we want to get all rights, which is to say television and movie rights. So I called Mr. Spruder on Sunday. Uh, he was being besieged that day. Uh, Incredibly, that Saturday morning, no network television showed up. It was all print and newsreel. Uh, network television had just gone from 15 minutes a night to half an hour, and television was really preparing for the funeral in New York and sort of ignoring the crime in Dallas. He seemed quite relieved to hear from me. On Monday, I went into his office we concluded uh, our negotiation at that point in about half the time that it took on Saturday. And his lawyer, a man named Sam Passman, Alexander has talked about anti-Semitism. And Dallas, 50 years ago, I hope I won't offend any of you, but was, was a tough town. Uh, it, it was a very conservative place uh, that uh, had spit on Adley Stevenson when he visited it, mm -hmm. had booed Lyndon Johnson himself when he was here, and the lawyers said to Mr. Spruder, he said, Abe, he said, I'll be blunt. And I had this conversation with me in the office, which was just kind of astonishing. He said, Abe, when the word gets out, that somebody named Abraham Sapruder has sold his film of the assassination, he said, there is going to be an anti-Semitic firestorm in this town. And he said, we had agreed that, that we would pay a total of $150,000 and $25,000 installments. He said, I would suggest to you that you take the first installment of $25,000 and give it to the family of J.D. Tippett, who was a Dallas cop. After Lee Harvey Oswald from this building killed the president, he went to his rooming house, Irving, Texas, and then we're not quite sure where he was headed, maybe for Marina. He was stopped by a Dallas cop only a few minutes later and after a few moments of questioning, he pulled out a pistol and shot the Dallas policeman four or five times, direct. Shot him in the head and then and shot him down on the ground. I mean, a, a total cold-blooded murder. And they were, the, they had set up a fund for the widow and children of this slain Dallas policeman. And that suggestion was, at twenty-five thousand, I write a twenty-five thousand dollar check, the first installment to this cop's family. And Abraham Sapruder said, "Sam, that is a wonderful idea," and it was done. I think I would just say that um, the only thing that I, I there there are so many things to say about mm -hmm. the film and about our grandfather, but I think the thing that that I have learned and that is, I think, worth reiterating is that, you know, the Zapruder film was not the Zapruder film. 
on November 22nd, 1963. Mm -hmm. It became the Zapruder film, and it took decades for that to happen. It took time for all of the complexity of the film to be understood by people. What Jim alluded to about the different ways that you can look at the film and, and your, see your truth in it, I think has to do with you know, how much people bring their beliefs to the question of who killed the president, but also it has to do, and, and it has opened up questions about sort of the limits of visual representation, which is kind of a postmodern question in our time. What do you do with something that is an object that shows you exactly, exactly what happened without showing you exactly what happened? What does that even mean? How do you even understand something like that? Um, and so, and, and on and on and on, questions about money, questions about the commodification of images, what people should see, what they shouldn't see, who makes that decision. All of these questions folded over and over themselves over time. And what we talk about as the Zapruder film now was not that on that day and in those weeks following. It was just a home movie that uh, one man accidentally took. Mm. and you know, people were trying to figure out what to do with it, and a lot of people weren't paying any attention to it at all, because as my aunt has reminded me countless times, and my mother too, they were grieving for the, people were grieving for the president. Mm -hmm. They weren't thinking about the Zapruder thing. You know, Dick Stolle was, because that was his job, mm -hmm. but, but not the rest of the world. And so it became this over time, and I, I just think it's an important, and, and, and the last thing I will say is that it became this long after my grandfather died. Mm -hmm. You know, he died in 1970. I don't think he ever fully lived, you know, he didn't live to really see what it would become and all mm -hmm. the things that would, would grow out of it. He certainly wouldn't have imagined this <laughs> as, no. a, as a first no. question in the Q&A. Um, Alex, how did, you, how did you like Paul Giamatti's portrayal of <laughs> Of your grandfather in the in the in the Parkland movie. <laughs> Is this a trap? <laughs> are you, are you aware? There's a movie out there called Parkland, which <clears throat> recreates um, Mr. Spruder with, was this Academy Award-winning actor Paul Giamatti playing him. I mean, I think I, I, all I would say is that, you know, Paul Giamatti is a man with great gravitas, and mm. I totally appreciate that he was picked to play the role. I think that he portrayed him very sympathetically, for which I think I can say we were all grateful. And I think he did get to, clearly tried to get to the emotional turmoil and the complexity of that moment for our grandfather. And I think he plumbed it, you know, really, really very well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't have any, um, anything more to say. I mean, I'm not a film critic, so. Isn't anybody going to ask well, I was, how I was portrayed yes. in the movie? The, I don't think the actor now, who played, now, now, wait, now, I want to say, I don't Dick, think the actor who played Dick Stolle was handsome enough. Well, he, <laughs> he probably wasn't handsome enough, but he smoked a lot more than Dick, well, than Dick ever did. Well, I mean, the first, first thing, he, got, he had dark hair, I had blonde hair back then. <laughs> he was wearing glasses, I didn't wear glasses, he, and he was puffing on a cigarette. I mean, but, you know, the, the way Hollywood portrays the 60s is they give a cigarette to everybody. Yeah, I think they had everybody your father smoking a cigarette in the so movie. So this guy was puffing away. I was a marathon runner back then. For God's sake, I didn't <laughs> smoke cigarettes. And, and, and I you were chasing him with wild well, turkey on the rocks. In, <laughs> in the movie, it, it took me four minutes to extract the film from from uh, Mr. Sapruder and. In truth, I was there for about an hour and a half, but uh, <laughs> movies speed things up. Yeah. They do treat our negotiations, Life magazine, and all the rest very respectfully, so I I'm pleased to say that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, if Oswald was an expert shot, did you happen to have this kind of question posed in your research? If he was an expert shot acting alone, why didn't he fire while the motorcade was inching toward him on Houston Street. I, I Does this was, suggest or refute that he acted alone in your opinion? Well, I mean, I'm going to be careful not to give too much of I mean, my opinion in all of this. Yes, that is something we, particularly just now when I was on the sixth floor standing at the uh, window looking mm -hmm. out, you do that did come back to me. I thought, well, gee, why was it, why would he have waited? Um, there's a lot of 
nobody has a definitive, a definitive answer to that. Certainly, I don't. Uh, but you know, I was just looking out the window now and wondering about myself. Like, well, why? I mean, first of all. <laughs> oh no! Uh, wait, Dick he's going to go the there. Answer, Hold on, so. no, I mean, <laughs> he's going to go there. He's up there. There is the windshield <laughs> of of the limo, and then the Governor Conley and his wife Nellie in jump seats in front of the president and Mrs. Kennedy. So, in in some ways, you had to get a windshield and four other people out of the way before you had a clear shot at the president. But then, but then Connolly was also slightly to the, I mean, that's also a magic bullet question. He was slightly to the left yes, of the president. So arguably, windshield aside, you might have had a, you know. And you know what's fun in the passage of time is, is you, you know, you look, you look up there now and maybe you wonder about the earlier shot a bit more because there wasn't that big tree right. back then. And that shot... Yeah. might have been easier, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. everything gets crazy. I mean, it's a very good question, and it's a question that a lot of people have wrestled with, and there isn't an answer. Uh, what happened to the original Zapruder camera? You know, I think he, that he gave the camera to Bell and Howell, who then gave it to the FBI, if I'm not mistaken. It was tested mm -hmm. extensively mm -hmm. for speed. It was slightly faster than, you know, I think the normal frame speed was 16 frames a second and his ran at 18.2 or something like that. Um, so it, and then it, it eventually ended up um, in the National Archives. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's on exhibit right now at the museum mm -hmm. um, in Washington, D.C. There's an exhibition about the assassination. And, and I'll tell you, it's funny, I had never seen it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was because of Nicola, the director here, who came down to the opening and who invited me to come with her that I, we didn't even know about it. Um, but I went and saw the camera. I knew what it looked like because we have a replica of it that Bell, Bell and Howell gave to our grandfather. Mm -hmm. So I had seen what it looked like. But the thing that really struck me when I saw the camera and the, was the case, because the case of the camera is incredibly beautiful. It's just beautifully designed, you know, really sort of 60s design. And it just made, and I told my aunt this when I, after I got back that evening, it just reminded me of him and his, our grandfather and his aesthetics, his love of mm -hmm. sort of beautiful things and well-made things and things that ran well. And um, when you see the camera and you see this case, it really sort of calls that to mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, do any of you, this is for the three of you, do you think it could happen again? <laughs> Aunt Myrna says yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything can happen in this world. Every time the President of the United States goes into public, I hold my breath, quite frankly. Um, and particularly, I mean, I, I covered Lyndon Johnson, so I, and I know how the Secret Service operates and, and how worried they are. When the president plunges into the crowd, the Secret Service goes nuts mm -hmm. because they realize, I mean, they're con you just see them like this going all the time. And somebody could have a gun there and uh, this could happen all over again. Yeah. Whatever happened, I think we've alluded to this earlier because we pointed over there, but whatever happened to uh, to Mr. Zapruder's dress factory. The Jennifer Jr.'s... He, if I'm not mistaken, he continued to run the factory until he got sick, right? He ran Jennifer Jr.'s until he got sick. And his partner, Erwin mm -hmm. Schwartz, who was the son of Abe Schwartz, who was his original partner in Jennifer Jr.'s, Erwin was actually with him all throughout the day of the assassination and um, went with him to the Kodak and then to Jameson to get duplicates made and then back to Kodak to have and processed and had been with him and Irwin took over the business I, I believe after our grandfather died he died in 1970 mm -hmm. um, of cancer so um, and, and then I don't know how long the company remained in existence mm -hmm. after that Jim is there any credence to the rumors that LBJ was part of the conspiracy uh, I don't think so at all um, but you know ask somebody else and you'll get a different answer <laughs> I think that's um, absurd. I mean, he did say he didn't believe the magic bullet theory. Um, he also said in the 70s that he did not think Oswald acted alone. He, he was, am I correct, Dick? He, 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 was, he gave some credence to the conspiracy theory. Yes. 
he said he thought Oswald may have pulled the trigger, but that, you know, he didn't seem to think that he acted alone. But was LBJ a part of it? I don't, I think that's absurd. We are getting the signal to wrap things up, um, and um, there are a few questions still here, but we will be here, um, and you can ask them directly. Most of them actually do traipse around to things that we have already covered, um, but we thank you all for coming. Um, it's, uh, I don't think we, you know, uh, done a book perhaps ever that was so involving for us um, and that we're, uh, you know, so even though the, the subject matter is sad, um, that we're so happy to talk about um, with people who are interested in it. So thanks again for coming out. Thanks for your great museum. <laughs>